All right, my name is Mike Washville. I'm one of the volunteers at the Cold War Museum at Vent Hill Farm Station, the location of U.S. Army Monitoring Station Number 1. 82 years ago, the Army bought this farm 40 miles south of D.C. to set up a radio monitoring station and signal intelligence school during World War II. Today, though, I'm going to speak about another Cold War classic, a very big high-frequency receiving and direction-finding antenna, the FLR-9 Elephant Cage. There were eight of these things built around the world for the Army and the Air Force. The Navy built 16 of their version of this type of antenna. It's always fascinated me. I started my career in 1980 in the U.S. Army as an electronic warfare and inter intercept systems repairer. I worked on tactical systems of the 1st Armored Division in Germany, 81 to 83. But down in Augsburg, Germany, they had one of these giant antennas. And it's a piece of technology that's always fascinated me. So I'm going to start off with a little snippet from the National Security Agency video titled The Last Elephant Cage. And I like it because it offers drone shots from inside and around this huge antenna. Okay. <laughs> Running out of horsepower on the the processor here. Yeah, I think it's having a hard time simultaneously playing the video and compressing it and streaming it. <laughs> if you've got 40 acres, it's yours. If you could click uh, got it to uh, dismiss that meeting as being recorded banner, that would be welcome. All right, no, not to take the video next time. <laughs> All right, well, we could probably kill that video. Let's see here. Ah, oh, there you go. Adobe, there we go. Okay. This is the FLR9 oh. elephant cage. You still saw have the guard. One, the... What you need? Uh, Spot still have the banner saying this meeting is being recorded. Uh, that that banner, you have to say okay. We can't we can't do it. I can't do it on my desktop. I did okay. it on my desktop. Uh, Sorry. Excuse me. Let's see. Can I kill that process on the uh, video stream too, just to get that out of the way? Yeah. Just, uh... Close window on that one. Take a little bit of the processor power back. All right, this is a picture of the ANFLR9 elephant cage in Augsburg, just north of Munich in Germany. As I said, there were eight of these antennas produced around the world for the Army and the Air Force there. All right, uh, we slide showing. There we go. This antenna is an HF receive direction finding antenna for SIGINT purposes used by the Army Security Agency, the Air Force Security Service, and the National Security Agency. This particular antenna right there, the ground view, is over in Yunnan, Thailand, the 7th Radio Research Unit, which is Army Security Agency facility. You can see the people standing in front of the antenna array. It's a little big. Those individual outer elements, the monopoles for the A-band are 105 feet tall. Behind them, there are 96 B-band antennas, 35 feet tall, 
120 foot reflector screen back there. And in the back, that small little thing back there is a 300 foot diameter C-band antenna array. This technology is originally derived from German designs. During World War II, the Germans had a antenna codenamed the Wollenweber, the wool weaver, as their classified codename for this. It was designed by the NVK, the Nachtrichtens Mittelversuchskommando, the Intelligence Materiel Research Development Group of the German Kriegsmarine. They built these antennas, used them for HF direction finding. They then, after the war ends, we capture the technology and find out that it offers some, some interesting capabilities. We improve upon it and then deploy these around the world. There's two photos of two different versions of the original German antenna. There's a 360-foot diameter reflector screen, 40 monopole antennas in a circle around that. Each one of those antennas, of course, has a cardioid radiation pattern facing away from the array. All of those antennas are connected to the central house. In the central house building with equal length cables, those signals come in. They're connected to a device known as a goniometer, a device that allows you to electronically slew a directional antenna beam, selectively combining multiple antennas together at a time to produce a directional array for direction finding purposes. That's the original German goniometer. You notice the wheel that he has there. It's a manually operated DF antenna. He moves that wheel, it moves 16 antennas at a time, combines those antennas together with a device that was known as a sign compensator because the relative phases of the signals coming into the individual antennas are based on the sign of the angles between the antennas there. Those signals are combined together, go to a DF receiver that then allows them to determine the line of bearing the direction of the incoming signal. That's a picture of the schematic of the sign compensator. It's a device that effectively acts as a delay line with combinations of capacitors and inductors in there. On the outside of that ring are individual capacitive coupling elements that allow you to capacitively couple to a group of antennas at a time. And as you move the internal disk that contains a sign compensator, it's taking different groups of antennas and combining them together to give you an electronically steerable beam without having to move any of the antenna elements. Now, when World War II ends, most of these antennas are destroyed, but this technology is captured by both the Allies and also by the Soviets. The most important thing, though, is we capture a couple of the German scientists that were involved in the development and operation of these devices. Now, when the Russians get this, they pretty much take the original design and essentially build 30 copies of this system, the Krug, the wheel antenna there. They build those around the Soviet Union. They use them for intelligence collection, direction finding. They use them for air navigation systems because, of course, the Soviet Union being 11 time zones wide and spanning the entire half of the northern hemisphere, they don't have the type of infrastructure we have for aerial navigation. So they utilize HF radio and HF direction finding systems to provide position monitoring and position reporting for commercial and military aircraft across the Soviet Union. Here's a close-up view of that. You see the cage monopoles. They provide broadband HF coverage. You see the reflector screen behind there. That's providing that directional characteristic away from the array in different directions. Now, of course, the U.S. Navy gets some of this technology. They set up a contract with the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana to start studying the Wallen Weber circularly disposed antenna array technology, find new ways to use it, new ways to improve sensitivity, accuracy, and functionality of the system. This is a picture of the 900-foot diameter experimental antenna at the Bonville radio site out in Illinois. They built a much larger array than the Germans had. They put more antennas around it. They also come up with an interesting trick. The original German antenna only did direction finding, but the folks at the University of Illinois decide, well, if we take multicouplers and connect a multicoupler amplifier splitter to every single antenna element, I can take those antenna elements and use one port to the goniometer for direction finding. But now I have additional antenna ports. I can make fixed beam formers and create multiple high gain directional beams off of the same antenna array at the same time, and then take one port from each multicoupler, do a passive coupler, combine every single antenna together to produce omnidirectional coverage. 
So they perfect the technique to A, use the multi-coupler amplifiers to improve sensitivity. B, they increase the functionality by adding both directional high gain antenna beams off this antenna and omnidirectional receive at the same time. So now one antenna array serves three purposes, DF, omnidirectional receive, and high gain directional receive from a single array. Late 1950s, about 75 miles north of here in a place called Huntley Meadows, there's a park just south of Alexandria, Virginia. The Naval Research Lab builds an experimental array with 40 elements. They test out different types of antennas. Do they need the reflector screen? Can they use the monopoles without reflector screens? Could they use half rhombic antennas, basically a V-shaped set of wire? Terminating resistor at the far end, use those in a circular array to provide directional coverage and wider frequency bandwidth capability. So they tried it. They determined the half rhombics didn't work very well. You don't get a lot of front to back ratio using the beam former alone without having that reflector screen there. So they settle on a design using the central circular reflector screen, antenna elements arranged outside the reflector screen with those broadband sleeve monopoles. That's a picture of the experimental 400 foot array about 1956, 1957. It's a very nice report from the Naval Research Lab on that. It's available on the internet there on the link. Offers some interesting detail about that. You have 40 elements in a circle. You have the reflector screen in the middle. You've got the central house with the electronics, the ability to do the beam forming, the ability to do the direction finding. There's a ground level view showing you a close up of the monopoles and it looks like this prototype was made out of galvanized steel culvert sections from what I can tell there, if you look at the corrugations on the metal on the monopole sleeves, but hey, it was an experimental antenna, it wasn't that critical. This overhead view is kind of interesting. On the right are two different antenna arrays, part of a device known as a GRD6, a ground-based direction finding system, a low band and a high band array. They are UAD cock antenna systems. There are eight antennas in a circle, and there's an additional antenna in the middle as a sense antenna. So that array right there with that large footprint is required to cover two to 30 megahertz and provide DF capability. On the left is the 400 foot diameter CDAA, which provides the functionality across the entire HF spectrum with that much larger array. And at the same time would allow you those high gain directional beams out of that antenna. So the Naval Research Lab decides on a design. They've done their prototype at Hybla Valley. They go ahead and design what's known as the FRD-10, Fixed Radio Antenna Direction Finding Number 10. They deploy about 16 of these things around the world to different locations, including two that belong to the Canadian Navy that are operated on behalf of the United States and Canada up in Canada there. There's a low band array in the middle, and then a little further out is a slightly shorter reflector screen with 120 high band antenna elements. There's a picture of the one that used to be at Imperial Beach in Coronado, California, subsequently been torn down there. You can see the operations building in the middle. The Navy decides to put all their radio operators and their electronics and everything in the central building. The Army and the Air Force put the operators outside the array and just have a giant tunnel that you'll see in a bit taking all of the signals from the antenna array and transporting it over to the ops building. The inner ring there is the low band array, two to nine megahertz. The outer ring is the 120 elements of the high band array with the reflector screen. This diagram shows you how different combinations of those antennas are phased together to produce those directional high gain beams. The fixed beam formers basically just provide a set of delay lines they delay the signals until they're all in phase, and they produce a beam every, in this case, 12, 14 degrees around the compass there, or 12 degrees around the compass, there are 30 of these beams, high band and low band array beams in there. So it's a very useful antenna because you're doing several things with a single array, multiple purposes at the same time. Out at Sugar Grove, West Virginia, a little west of here, the U.S. Navy decides to put two of these antennas in place. So you think you've got a problem with having one giant 900-foot antenna. They've got two of them spaced about 1,400 feet apart. Ironically enough, the Sugar Grove, West Virginia site is a Naval Security Group signal intelligence site, but these antennas aren't used for signal intelligence purposes. 
What they decide in 1969 is that the U.S. Navy communication station, receiving station at Cheltenham, Maryland, south of D.C., the noise floor is getting so high that it was becoming unusable as an HF receive site. So they go out to the National Radio Quiet Zone, up on the top of the hill there at Sugar Grove. They put two of these antennas in a diversity receive configuration and use them just for naval general service communications, not intelligence collection. Strange but true. I always like to joke that, well, once the Air Force and the Army built their 1,200-foot diameter antenna, the Navy had to one-up them, so they went to stereo here. There's a picture of the field station Misawa in Japan giving you an idea of the scale and size of this thing. There's a little road leading to the operations building in the middle. There are the giant monopoles on the outside for A-band, the smaller stub your monopole for B-band, and then the C-band antenna ring in the middle. Eight of these things are built. Six of these for the Air Force, two of these for the U.S. Army in the 1960s there. GTE Sylvania is a primary engineering contractor on the Air Force antennas, and FNM Corporation builds the last two V7 and V8 antennas for the Army at Field Station Augsburg and at Yudon, Thailand there for the 7th Radio Research Unit. As I said, these antenna arrays provide omnidirectional receive coverage. 48 elements in a circle, 96 for the B-band there. They're all combined together into one omnidirectional antenna. You've got 48 15 dB gain beams coming off of this antenna array. Every seven and a half degrees around the compass, simultaneously, you have those high gain beams being formed. You've got multiple lower gain but wider sucker beams. So I could cover a chunk of spectrum or a chunk of the uh, azimuth there in 60 to 90 degrees or so and cover a much wider area for signals that might be mobile targets or things that are moving. And simultaneously, I've got high accuracy DF. Typical DF systems with short baselines, antennas that are 20 to 30 to 50 feet apart. Your DF accuracy at HF is typically about three to five degrees, plus or minus in the direction of arrival. Because this antenna is effectively a 1200 foot diameter antenna, and it's got about an 1100 foot baseline between the outer elements, the angular resolution on these is down to a fraction of a degree at HF. Very useful. Reception range is approximately 4,000 nautical miles. Of course, that depends on the particular operating frequency, the time of day there, but it covers a much wider area. Three bands, 48 A-band antennas there on 2 to 6 megahertz, the large poles around the outside, 96 of the 6 to 18 megahertz B-band, and then another 48 uh, C-band antennas formed out of 96 separate little bow-tie dipoles. That's the antenna, a vertical view of the antenna at Elmendorf Air Force Base. You can see the A and B band in the outer ring. You can see the C band ring and the roundhouse, the electronics building in the middle where all the combining work is done to produce the antenna beams and do the direction finding. A tunnel then goes from that building over to the operations building on the right where the radio operators sit at their intercept positions. There's a side view and certainly not to scale because of course this thing from the inside to the outside is 600 feet from the center of the antenna axis there. But you can see the A-band, B-band, A-B reflector screen, C-band antenna array, and then the control building. This antenna is as big as the Pentagon. It's 600 feet out to the uh, E-ring on the Pentagon there, and it's about 610 feet to the outside of the antenna array here. This thing is huge. It's actually 50 feet taller than the Pentagon because the Pentagon's only 71 feet tall, and this thing is 120 feet tall on that reflector screen. It is a massive, massive antenna system. There's a view from the ground standing next to one of the A-band elements, looking at the ring of the A-band, the B-band elements, and the vertical reflector. There's a picture from Ms. Sauer in 2005 when they're getting ready to start the project to tear that antenna down giving you an idea of the scale of this thing. The sleeve monopoles are interesting. You basically essentially have a large grounded conductor on the outside. The central conductor comes up through there and sticks out, essentially like a coaxial probe. Because it's not a monopole, like a quarter wave monopole directly above a ground screen, but it's more of a coaxial probe on the end of a conductor there, and the ground is further away, it doesn't have the same narrow band response that a monopole antenna would have directly on a ground screen uh, at the feed point there. 
That's how you get the two to six meg coverage on the A band. You get the six to uh, 18 megahertz coverage on the B band by using that sleeve monopole design. There's a close up view and a schematic view of how those are designed. The grounded sleeve, the central conductor going up to the radiating element, and you've got the matching network that's in there that's providing the impedance matching to the 75 ohm coaxial cable. There's the C band, 300 foot diameter, 70 feet tall. It's basically the width of a football field. Again, this thing is all on massive proportions. There are two rings of 48 of those bow tie dipoles on there. The bow tie dipoles are basically large square arrays of material fed with a small little feed point in the middle. Because they are very wide, very broad elements there, they have a three to one frequency coverage on there. Again, you're not trying to match a transmitter, you're merely doing reception. Close up on those, it's a little hard to see the dipoles against all of the screen in the back there, but essentially you have the two large rectangular frames, they come down to the feed point right in the middle there. The upper and lower rings of dipoles are both connected together with coaxial stubs, like this, coaxial phasing harnesses and coaxial dipoles, uh, and uh, balance there. Pretty familiar technology, just on a much bigger scale than anyone would normally use. This entire antenna system is connected together with 75 ohm coaxial hardline, LDF 5-75. I want to be the salesman at Andrew Corporation when somebody calls up and says, hi, I need some cable for an antenna. What do you need? Well, I need 17 and a half miles of cable inside the array. Well, how many of these do you need? Well, I need eight of them around the world. And oh, by the way, I also have to connect all these signals back to the main building. And I'm going to need a little more coax for that. This is a picture of the commercial station in construction. You can see the trenches that they dig. All the cables are about four feet underground in little trenches that are backfilled with sand to buffer the cable and to provide some temperature stability. Because the goal here is to provide phase match cables between every single antenna and the equipment inside there so all the cable lengths are equal, so all the antenna signals get there at the same time. And you don't have differences there because the entire purpose of the beam formers in the direction finding array is to get signals simultaneously to the roundhouse. Again, you've got this massive system providing these multiple functions. How does it do it? The omnidirectional is real simple. I just take a copy of every signal from every antenna, put it into a passive coupler that combines 48 antennas together. It doesn't care what direction the signal comes in. There's one of the antennas along the entire ring there feeding a signal into my omnidirectional coupler. The beam formers involve the construction of devices that phase multiple antennas together simultaneously such that it coherently combines, in the case of the monitor beams, about six antennas. In the case of the DF beams and the high gain beams, 16 separate antennas are phased together simultaneously. And finally, a sample from each of the antennas is said to the DF goniometer that allows me to electronically scan a rotating antenna pattern every five to 15 seconds, depending on the speed. Now there's a block diagram of the whole thing, but you have to remember this is the block diagram of three different bands, except there are 48 copies of each one of these because you have the beam formers for 48 separate high gain beams. So you get into the roundhouse and it quickly gets very complicated and very congested with a lot of wire and pieces and parts inside there. That round building in the middle, that 90 foot diameter building, there are eight separate sets of 24 antennas at a time that are fed into that building to ensure that all the cable lengths are equal. So you go around the building and there are eight different feed points that look just like that. The 26 pieces of coaxial cable, that come, 24 pieces of coaxial cable come in in the bottom. Up on the top, you have the devices known as the line tuners, fine tuning devices that are effectively variable length pieces of coaxial cable that allow you to fine tune, even though we try to cut the cables as close as possible to phase match, they might not still be matched, so you have the ability to stretch or shorten the lines a little bit electrically with these adjustable coaxial cable line tuners to make sure they're all equal phase. There's a diagram of one of those line tuners there. There's only 192 of these in the system, and you've got to make sure everything is phase matched and stays phase matched. This thing become, quickly becomes a maintenance nightmare. All the signals come in, the A band, B band, C band signals are handled separately by separate amplifiers, by separate combiner systems, but 
there is nothing but beam formers, the power splitters, the uh, preamplifiers, and the multicouplers there. There are 2,700 phase matched jumper cables and connecting cables inside the roundhouse. In addition to the 192 cables going out to the separate antennas, the hard line that's coming in, there are 2,700 cables from anywhere from 18 inches to 50 feet that have to be matched inside there in order to maintain the accuracy, the gain, the capabilities of the system. Again, it's a maintenance nightmare. You've got different types of beam formers. The main beam formers with 16 antennas apiece are giving us those tight beams, seven and a half degrees around the compass, 48 of those. So I can pick, if I wanna to listen to Moscow and I wanna to listen to Havana, Cuba, but I don't wanna hear Madrid, Spain, I can pick the appropriate beams on my antenna, feed those to my receivers there and not have to listen to off axis signals. The monitor beams are a little bit brighter there. They allow you to sec check whole sectors it's an interesting and amazing system. Here's how it works. Internal wave front comes in. It hits a pair of antennas. The first pair of antennas that are on the line of bearing closest to the uh, target. The next pair of antennas is struck as that wave front physically moves back, the number of feet displaced between one and the other. The next pair of antennas receives a signal a little later, a little later, and a little later. And finally, the last pair of antennas, antennas basically, you know, 17, 16, and 15 and 16, they get the signal last. If we delay the first pair of antennas the longest, the second pair of antennas a little less, a little less, a little less, a little less, and then no delay whatsoever for the two outer antennas, I can combine all of those antenna signals together. They all arrive at the feed point at exactly the same time and produce a high gain beam in one direction. So that is the principle of the beam former. It's merely delay line based phasing of all of the signals. This diagram shows, for example, the on the bottom, the required amount of time delay in nanoseconds to make sure these things get there at the same time. And at the top, in order to ensure the side lobes aren't too bad, they basically add a little bit of attenuation on the outermost elements. So they contribute a little less to the overall pattern than the ones in the center line there but it's all a question of time delay. So how do you do it? Well, the Navy did it real simple. If I need 10 feet or 20 feet or 50 feet worth of time delay between antennas, they just took the printed circuit board and made a trace on there that was 50 feet long. And the next antenna has to be delayed 30 feet. So they put a little less PC board on there and a little less. And finally down the left side there, you'll see the signal comes right in and goes right to the feed point down at the bottom there. That was real simple. When they build these in the real world, the Navy and the Air Force chose to use coax cable. They just took bundles of coax cable, figured out the velocity factor, and go, okay, I need this much delay, what's the velocity factor? I trim it down, make a bundle of cable, throw it in a rack. The Army, of course, decided they were gonna do it a lot simpler. They were just gonna take dozens and dozens and dozens of inductors and capacitors and resistors and build a combiner network like that. Now imagine having to have basically 192 of these things to sit there and go ahead and align and ensure they're all matched and phased together properly. You want to talk about a maintenance job, keeping that thing running and adjusting it and aligning it. I don't know whether they just had them supplied from the factory the way they were supposed to do it. Never got a chance to work on this one, but I would hate to be the guy that says, oh yeah, this thing's out. Somebody's going to have to go through and make sure all these channels to phase match to within a degree or so with that many parts inside it. But they did it. This diagram basically shows you how you start combining 16 antennas at a time. You index one antenna over, get the next 16 antennas, the next 16 antennas, the next 16 antennas around, around the compass in order to create your 48 beams there. Again, the antennas feed in, they feed to the multi-coupler amps, the beam formers for the adjacent beams are connected to different groups of antennas. Those signals are then sent over to the RF system that takes it back to the monitoring building. And at the same time, the goniometer outputs are fed from the multicouplers right to the direction finder. The goniometer, device with a rotating disc inside, a coupling mechanism that allows you, as you spin that disc around, to electronically, either capacitively or inductively, depending on the design, connect to a group of antennas that, as that disc spins around. There's a beam former built into that. That then produces the rotating antenna pattern 
to allow you to do the DFing. Now, the Germans use that little hand wheel, and you could do that if you've got a lot of time and you only have one operator time doing one job. With an electronically controlled goniometer and an electrical system that can tell me the angle of the actual beam, I can use that thing to continuously scan the RF spectrum, feed the output of that to multiple DF receivers. People on different frequencies can simultaneously use the same rotating beam from, say, the 2 to 6 megahertz beam. They can go ahead and do that. They don't bother each other. It allows simultaneously DF on multiple targets at the same time. Again, we go back to that little 1957 Navy report. This is how they built their goniometer. They couple the antenna signals in, the individual pads on the PC board. Then they've got the disk that spins around above it as a, very, as a uh, capacitor, and it capacitively couples to a combination of those different antennas there. Now, in the DF system, if you're doing DF, for example, with a loop antenna, you know that getting the null is far better than using the broad, very broad uh, peak of the antenna coverage pattern. The same type of thing happens here. They take those 16 antennas in the beamformer system, they produce two signals, a sum signal and a different signal. The sum signal is all 16 signals at a time. That's my broad-based, relatively broad-based 7.5 degree beam. But if I take the left half and the right half, the eight antennas at a time, and take the difference between those two, when I'm actually on the axis and those two are perfectly balanced, I get a very, very, very sharp null. If I divide the broad-based beam, the sum channel, by the difference channel, I get a very, very sharp, high gain, very narrow line of bearing off the system. I do not have the manual for the Flare 9, but the Navy manual here shows what happens. You do, up on the top there, a relatively broad beam from the sum channel. Okay, that gives you a reasonable DF bearing there. You could basically bisect it with a little scale and say, okay, it's kind of this direction. But down on the bottom, you see these two little bow ties that are coming out. That's the difference channel. And when they divide the sum in the difference channel, you get these two patterns there where you get that large, broad thing, but then a very, very, very narrow needle down there, providing that high gain, high resolution direction finding. So it's really neat to see some of this contemporary literature and see how they were doing this and what they did with this thing. Those are the goniometers. You have 48 antenna cables that go inside there. You have cables that come out the middle of it from slip rings. That allows you to get the sum channel, the difference channel, information on the position of the goniometer beam itself. There's three of these, one for each of the bands there. This is the inside of the roundhouse at one of the three facilities there, probably at Elmendorf Air Force Base. This is one on display down at uh, Joint Base San Antonio, the 25th Air Force, which is the uh, organization that took over from the Air Force Security Service for signal intelligence. That's one of the goniometers that was from the San Vito Air Base in Italy. Like I said, you got 48 beams on three different bands. You've also got monitor beams, you've got sector beams, omnidirectional signals, and you've got the DF signal. They've got to go back to the ops building to be used. So there's a tunnel. The tunnel contains 160 different pieces of 7 8 inch hard line to take all 160 signals back. The tunnel's one to 2,000 feet long. That means there's 27 to 54 miles of 7 8 inch hard line in that tunnel to take everything back from the roundhouse building to the ops building. Today, we would do that with a fiber optic cable system because I could easily take those. I could take a single 288 fiber, single mode fiber, put laser transceivers on one end, no loss, send it all the way back to the ops building without copper. But in this case, there's 54 miles of copper in some of these things. You know, Again, I'd love to be the guy at Andrew that gets the call for this because he's getting a new boat, a vacation house, and probably a new girlfriend on the side for the amount of money he's going to earn on commission on this. And when it gets to the ops building, there's a couple of people using this. So this is the back of one of the facilities at one of the field stations of the RS, RF switch matrix, showing you how all the signals can be delivered to different users, different operations, and different systems there. This is one of the early generation DF positions. You've got the ability to look on the scope and see the line of bearing there. If you're at Augsburg, for example, you could also send the DF tasking over to Caramersal, Turkey and one to San Vito Air Base in Italy and one to RAF Chick Sands, get three to four lines of bearing that allow you to converge very precisely on a particular target in Eastern Europe or some part of the Soviet Union. 
this is a later generation, mid-1980s. you got the replacement of some of the older receivers with the newer RACAL RA6970 receivers, the R2174s, uh, a few early generation computer systems and computer display screens there. This is a typical user operation here. This is an Air Force voice intercept facility. You've got the folks there with the R390A receivers. They've got their tape recorders. They've got their headphones transcribing enemy messages from around the world. This is one of the digital systems known as TMO, teletype intercept. You've got demodulators there. You've got the R390 receivers. You've got the high-speed, high-quality instrumentation recorders. These are used to intercept non-Morse, non-voice type signals. Here's Iron Horse, which was the code name for the system. RAF Chicksands in Great Britain, Augsburg in Germany, San Vito, Italy, and Karamersal in Turkey. A 1,400-mile DF baseline there. These antennas with a 4,000 nautical mile receive are covering basically two-thirds of the entire Soviet Union, all of Eastern Europe. In the Pacific Theater, Almendorf Air Force Base in Alaska, Field Station Masao in Japan, Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, and finally Yudon down in Thailand, forming the eastern half, the Pacific half of Iron Horse, covering the other two-thirds of the Soviet Union and also covering communist China. Caramersal, we shut it down in 1977 after that little trouble with the Greeks and the Turks over Cyprus. We pulled the stuff out. It gets demolished in the 90s, but we took all the critical components out early. Yudon, Thailand is shut down right after the Vietnam War. Clark Air Force Base is run out of the Philippines after Mount Pinatubo, and we lose our base licenses there in the Philippines anyway, so we shut that down. RAF Chicksands is taken out, destroyed in 1996. We don't need it after the end of the Cold War. San Vito Air Boys is shut down in 94, demolished in 2002. Mishawa is taken out in 2005. Field Station Augsburg is turned over to the German Bundesnachrichtendienst, the German Intelligence Service. It's still physically there. We don't know if they're using it or not, although there's a lot less HF to intercept, so we're not sure. And Elmendorf, the last elephant cage is shut down, but is still intact out in uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska near Anchorage. And that's the one that NSA did that nice movie on. So there's Field Station Augsburg in place. RAF Chicksands, you get rid of the antenna, but a 1,400-foot diameter flat round field with a 1,200-foot diameter set of antenna pedestals there is still a little bit visible, even from uh, satellite photographs. Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, though, they found a new purpose for it. They took it and they used some of that support structure and framework to make an outdoor amphitheater and concert venue. And they used some of the A-band and B-band antennas out there as flagpoles there, as decorative flagpoles. They kind of kept it in place. There's a lot less HF to have to intercept these days. As a result, there's no need for something on this scale with this number of receivers. It's a maintenance nightmare. These antennas were built in the 1960s, and as you saw in the original movie, they're made out of wood like old, unpainted roller coasters. After 50 or 60 years worth of exposure to the weather, it's going to be a problem to physically keep it up. There's 240 separate antenna elements, all the different antenna arrays, things you have to repair, things you have to keep in good shape. You think you have trouble keeping one or two or three antennas in your backyard running, try 240 of them there. There's 192 phase match feed lines that have to be maintained and have to be tuned and matched all the time. There were 192 separate amplifiers, the preamplifier units. And in the vacuum tube days, that was a nightmare. With aging of the vacuum tubes and aging of the components and keeping those things aligned, gain and phase matched, it was a nightmare. When they went to solid state, it dramatically improved some of it, but it still is, you've got to keep all those things running. And in fact, the Flare 9s were one of the earliest systems where they built automatic test equipment in. They had test signal generators and test signal monitors that would sit there and inject signals on specific frequencies on each of the bands, on each of the antenna inputs, and then monitor the outputs so they could basically have this thing constantly polling the system to look and see if something was out of spec in terms of gain or phase, notify the operators, notify the maintenance people like the Army 33S electronic warfare repairers, to go out there and start replacing components or realigning or fixing things. There's analog parts. It's all analog. And it's a huge antenna structure to have to keep up. 
modern digital signal processors, the ability to do correlation processing, the ability to digitize signals, build digital calibration tables to eliminate the need for physically and mechanically phase matching stuff, make this type of system obsolete. Now, PCI Corporation, they are a big contractor in signal intelligence stuff. They have diagrams, they have pictures, they have cartoon photos of their proposed elephant cage of the future. I don't know if they've ever built one. I'm not sure if they've supplied one with one, people with one. But if you were to combine this with an actual digital signal processor, you could actually build a very impressive system. And some of these systems are so impressive. Some of the modern HF intercept systems are such that they digitize the entire 2 to 30 megahertz HF band and continuously process the DF the entire band at the same time. It could be done. I don't know if they built it for anybody, but it's available. You know, that the technology is there. It could be done. And I could see where that could be useful to some people. So that is the story of the Flare 9. The story of the CDAA, how we got it from German technology, turned it into a very useful intelligence tool for close to 50 years. I've been fascinated by it as an engineer. I mean, I, it's amazing what they did with it, what they did with 1960s technology and beyond to make it work. So it's just been one of those things that, you know, I've been kind of enamored with for a while and put this thing together to go, hey, you know, other people should be able to appreciate some of the intricacies and some of the magic of what they were doing with this back when they did it. So if anybody's got any questions or anything, I'd be happy to take them. Yes, sir. What did they do? How did they protect? Well, you're going to have basically lightning arresters, that, you know, on the systems itself, provide grounding and all of the cables there. These antennas typically are shunt fed with a matching network. So it tends to eliminate a little bit of the problem there. But inevitably, you know, it wouldn't be surprising that an 1,100-foot device gets struck by lightning every once in a while. But that's why the you know, military's got maintenance techs to, to go out there and keep replacing parts. Yes? How much? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no damn idea, but 17 and a half miles of cable in a hard line plus... All those antennas plus the physical structure, I'm sure millions of dollars a piece. And this was in 1962 money. Yeah. yeah, they were not cheap. But then again, you know, the military cost is no object in most of the things that they do. Yes. What are they using today? Well, here's the thing you can do DFing with a lot simpler equipment. If you go to the FCC monitoring stations, you will find a, an array of antennas. There will be nine antennas in a triangular array. There's a base antenna at the vertex of this equilateral triangle. There's a pair of antennas out about 30 feet. There's another pair of antennas out about 60 feet, another pair of antennas out about 120 feet, and another pair of antennas out about 300 feet. What that is, is a four band triple channel interferometer system. At any one time, three of the antennas are used, the vertex antenna and the other two antennas. They do phase comparison with digital interferometer of the incoming wave front as it hits the three antennas to develop the line of bearing information from that. That requires the installation of nine antennas and nine digital receivers. The digital receivers can be digitally calibrated. You can eliminate any variations between those by basically monitoring a known signal, looking at the variation between channels, and then equalizing it out with an, an inverse calibration table. Very simple. The FCC monitoring stations use those interferometer type antennas, commercial and military systems are using that same type of technology because the digital technology avoids the need of physical beam formers and coaxial cable delay lines and this massive array of stuff. Now, you don't get the multi-channel high gain received that you get in one of these. But, you know, HF is far less significant than it used to be in terms of a signal intelligence target. So there's a lot less need for that. Did the people that next door to know what they were? Well, not really. They were surprised. You know, well, first off, the army goes into Augsburg, Germany. Uh, the U.S. Army is all over Europe anyway, and all over Germany. They told the people it was an elephant cage, or it was a dinosaur cage. And somebody goes, "Well, have you seen any dinosaurs around?" They go, "No." Well, it's working because there's no loose dinosaurs running around Bavaria. So they had no real idea what it was. They knew it was a giant antenna. They knew it was a secret military base, but you know, it wasn't really explained to too many people. Yes, sir. Any of them be classified as 
It's hard to say. I mean, some of that stuff was just tactical intercepts that might have been destroyed rather relatively quickly. No, we don't have any. Of, we don't have any of that there. No, I mean, it, it can be everything from the spy number transmissions you had. The other thing is, like Soviet air defense, unlike the United States, which eventually moves into what they call the semi-automated ground environment SAGE system, where radar sites would track stuff, but it would be digitally linked to the SAGE direction centers, and it would show up on the computers there in the FSQ-9. The Soviets, their air defense network consists of manual radars, people with high-speed morse sending messages to each other with coded number groups, indicating target track, target desk, you know, target location, target bearing, and, and speed. So some of the intercepts that are done are monitoring of things like that. Others are tactical and strategic military communications. Some of it, like that TiVo system, is Soviet and Warsaw Pact teletype and data transmissions that are intercepted. So it's the whole variety of things that might have been done on HF there. Other you talked about the, uh, the radio clients. Um, what, what the, what were, I, I can just imagine that a receiver like this picks up every toaster that's putting out of that RF signal. Well, you could. I mean, the first off, it is an HF antenna. If you're in close proximity to it, then, of course, it's going to pick that up. You're not going to hear a toaster at, you know, 200 miles away unless you're on the right frequency with the, you know. And it's hard. Most of them don't have particularly efficient antennas on them. It would be nearby noise, but it was just that they wanted to move out of the D.C. area because the D.C. area was just awash with, you know, uh, you had the uh, Air Force Globecom station and the Army had radio transmitting stations in Waldorf and Brandywine, Maryland, and Cheltenham was getting beat up by the Air Force and Army transmitters, the Navy transmitters over in Annapolis there. So they moved out there just because it was a quiet background and it was a good place to get away from that. To, to listen to the long-range HF communications from the ships at sea. And there are also their point-to-point -point strategic circuits. Yes? What's at, what's at the West Virginia site now? Is it just mountains again? There are two large circles on top of the hill. One of the circles is empty. The other circle has a lot of satellite dishes on it. Because as I said, the Naval Security Group never left. While they closed the base facility down in the valley for Sugar Grove, they're still up on the top of the hill with intercept facilities there. They need a lot fewer personnel than they did back in the vacuum tube days to sit there and poke at equipment or even sit there with headphones. You can remote that stuff anywhere in the world. So there are still intercept facilities out there at Sugar Grove on the top of the mountain, but you can see the spots where the two antennas were because those giant flat circular areas with the ground screen do not go away. Any questions to do? All right, thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present. I hope you found this enjoyable. We are open every weekend, 11 to 4 on Saturdays and 1 to 4 on Sundays. Right across from us is a barn. That barn contains the Vent Hill Winery, but 82 years ago, it was U.S. Army Monitoring Station number one. And, there are and there's a presentation I have on how the road to D-Day actually starts in that barn in November of 1943, seven months before the battle at Normandy. An interesting little piece of World War II history out of that site. Thanks.